Welcome to Intro to Procedural Modeling, Lesson 5. In Lesson 5, we are going to start to, to cover the process of uh, procedurally grouping objects. Okay, so this is different um, from, and I don't need all this stuff now. I don't need my details view anymore. All right. So this is uh, different than actually uh, grouping with the parent uh, nodes. Okay, so before we saw how we can parent um, objects by connecting their parent group nodes, okay, in this way. And this basically means that everything is relative to whatever this parent node is. Okay, so these guys will are now grouped um, based on a transform mentality, okay? What we want to do is get into grouping geometry and points and lines and stuff like that so we can use that information in our procedural workflows. So uh, what I want to do is um, I want to start to um, build out a primitive. So I'm going to build out a box. So I'm going to hit tab. Let's do a box. And this will make it real easy for us to actually identify what we're doing when we are using um, the grouping methods. So to group anything, um, what we can do is utilize the group node. So we're going to use group. Okay, and if you feed the data from whatever node that you're trying to group into that group node, um, there's a couple things that we need to set up in terms of starting to understand how grouping works from a procedural standpoint. So the first thing is that the node ha itself has a name. So this is going to be group, let's say, 001. But then you also have a group name. Now this is the actual group name that will y be used um, when you start to um, use the groups in the procedural networks that you build. Okay, so this is the actual name. This is the name of the node. So it's good to keep a, a clear distinction between those. Okay, so now um, if we actually go and middle mouse click, what I'm going to do is actually create a null node. Now null nodes don't do anything. They just allow you to pass data through. Basically, this doesn't actually do anything. But what we can do is I can middle mouse click on this, and you'll notice that I now have a new primitive group, and I have six primitives in box face. That is that box face group that we have declared. If I set this node to bypass, which is the yellow flag over here, you'll notice now I don't have any more groups. And that's because Houdini is actually going through and taking all the geometry and putting it into this group called box face. All right. Now, why is this useful? Because now we can start to isolate out sections of our geometry and place them into specific groups. So let's start with a, a nice example of grouping different faces. Okay, so let's go back to our group node. And I want to actually tell box face to use, um, let's go to wireframe here. I, I want to use face two and face one. So I want those two in my group. I don't want any of the other faces in my group. So what we're going to do is we're going to group by pattern in this number right here, okay? And we want to group by primitives, that's fine. And we, we can look for different um, geom or, yeah, geometry types, but in this case, because we're just doing a simple example, we'll just take all types. So all I need to do is type in those ID values, okay? So I just type in one, space, and two. And when I do that, <clears throat> Let me go back out of wireframe mode here. So when I do that, now I should have just two primitives now in my box space. All right, so those two primitives now are actually in that group itself over here. So let's actually verify that by um, doing something with those particular faces, okay? So after this null here, let's put in a poly extrude node. And we'll connect the null to the poly extrude. And now what we can do is we can tell the poly extrude to use a group, a specific set of primitives in this case. We're going to use box space. And when we do that and we do an inset, you'll notice that only those two faces that we included in this case get extruded. So we can actually push them out a little bit more. We can inset them. All right. And we can actually dynamically update our groups if we want more. So let's say I want to do, let's go back to our original box. And let's do 3 and 0, but not the tops. Okay. 
So I can actually dynamically do this. So I want three and zero. And there you go. So now we're dynamically changing that. And you can do that on the fly with your procedural networks. You can decide which faces get extruded and which ones don't. Because our data is non-destructive, we can always jump back, maybe create some loop with like a copy node um, to increase the number here. All right, because you'll notice that we just have one, two, three, zero, and those are all those side faces. Alrighty, so that basically gives us the ability to um, do all that. All right, so we can isolate out certain sections of our model um, procedurally and start to um, perform operations on just those sections that we've grouped. All right, so you'll notice too in a group node, there's a couple of different things we can do. There's all the creation methods, all right? So we have the bounding, normal, you can also group by edges, all right? But there's also combine and there's also edit. And these guys allow us to take other groups and either delete them or we can combine them into this current group, all right? So what I want to do here is actually create a couple of things here. So you'll notice in the poly extrude, there's a groups tab and it allows us to actually output those groups. And so what these groups are now are the extrude front, the extrude back, and the extrude side. All right, so we can actually utilize these. So let's do another poly extrude this time. So I can do poly extrude. All right, and let's see what happens when we do include the extrude front now. And I extrude those guys out. You can see that it's actually selected just those inset faces that we extruded in the previous poly extrude right here. And that all started because we grouped it only to use the box face primitives. Alrighty. So let's say we wanted to um, include the, the front and the side. So this is how we can start to branch off here. And let's do a combine. So let's actually combine. So I'm going to do another group node. I'm going to feed in the data from my poly extrude 1. All right, so from just the inset faces there that we did. And what I want to do is call this my combine group. But then this time I'm going to go and um, go to the, uh, I'm not going to create any groups, but I want to combine. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give the group a new name and I'm going to say um, final GRP for group there. And we'll get rid of that I. And what I want to do is I want to say, so final group is going to be equal to all these groups. So I'm going to say extrude front and extrude side. So what that means is that now I have the front and the sides all grouped together. So let's do a, another poly extrude and take a look at that. So I'm going to do a poly extrude and then let's get the uh, final group in there. And we'll do an extrude. And now you'll notice that we've combined those side faces with that front face, and we can extrude out that whole group together. Alrighty. <coughs> all right. So then you'll notice that we actually still have all those groups left. Okay. And it's not a good idea um, if you start getting larger networks um, in here. Um, it's always a good idea to keep your grouping clean and not have all this data lag around um, all the way throughout your graph because all this is taking a certain amount of time to compute. And you want your graphs to be, you know, certain within a certain amount of performance uh, ability. So you basically want them to move really quickly when we're trying to create variations. And so to clean all these up, what we can do is we can use another group node like so. All right, we can actually, we're not going to create anything, so I don't need to create a new group name. But what we can do is we can go through and delete groups that we previously had because we're all done with all of our operations. So now let's create a clean piece of geometry. So I'm going to get rid of box face. I'm going to get rid of final group. Extrude back, front, and side. And let's put down a new null node so we can see the results of our deleting or our cleanup. So now if I minimize click, I have no more groups, but all the groups are still being retained in this section of the graph over here. We didn't lose anything. So we can continue on by grouping um, different things. So the last thing I want to show you is um, a little bit more of an advanced way to group things. So I want to explore some other ways here. So I'm going to go to group and let's actually go and group 
some other part of this particular geometry, but this time we're not going to do by number, okay? I'm just going to call this um, the normal group. And I do actually like keeping my names the same. That way I can see the node name and I know that the group name is exactly the same. It's just a workflow habit. All right, so I can quickly visualize out here and know that um, my group name is actually the same name as that node. I just wanted to point out in the beginning of the video that these two things are separate. Okay? So what we want to do is actually go over to normal. So what we can do with normal is we can actually start to um, select things based off of normal angles. Okay? So if we view our normals here, you can see that we have normals that are mostly pointing up, mostly pointing down, and mostly pointing to the left and right. So I want to I want to select all the faces that are mostly pointing upwards and do something with those. Okay, so I'm going to say enable, and what I want to do is test the y direction. Okay, and I want to make sure that my spread angle. So you can see how the difference there. So these these darker shaded faces are the ones being grouped, and the lighter faces aren't grouped. So the normal group has actually started to isolate out those top ones. So let's do a test with those. I'm going to put down a poly extrude. And I want to inset just the top faces here. So I'm going to do my inset on just the normal group. And you notice that all we have is the normal group in here because we did our, we cleaned up everything up here. All right. So now I have the normal group. I'm just going to inset just those faces. And let's actually keep the points shared. Alrighty. So then we can do another poly extrude and make sure that we output groups here. And I only want the front, so I can actually remove these back and side group names so that when we create the output groups, we only create the, the front. So we'll pass that through to our second, and this time we're only going to do the extrude front. And let's extrude that up like so. Bam. So that basically is how grouping works inside of Houdini. To really top this off, let's actually add a facet node. And we will cusp our normals so that we get hard edges for everything. And there you have it. That is how grouping is achieved inside of Houdini for procedural workflows. <laughs>Welcome to Intro to Procedural Modeling, Lesson 6. In this particular lesson, we are going to cover how to delete geometry uh, by using the delete node or the blast node. All right, just so we can go through how we uh, utilize these to create new sets of geometry based off of um, either face ID or primitive IDs or vertex IDs. All right, so let's actually get started here. Uh, I'm going to drop down a new geometry node there, our parent. Um, transform at least and I'm gonna create a box again all right just because it's a little bit simpler to see and work with I'm gonna turn off the grid here in my viewport and let's actually display the primitive numbers in here so we have all these numbers that actually represent the face of each side of this box over here all right and so what we can do is we can start to delete off certain faces to create new geometry if we if we want okay so let's uh, just do a really basic example here of how we use a delete node. All right, so over here in the network view, I'm going to hit tab and start typing out delete. And I'm going to drop that down. There we go. So right off the bat, you notice that nothing happened, right? And that's because what we need to do is we need to tell the delete node um, if we have a group of objects that we want to delete. We need to tell it what we want to do if we want to delete the selected or non-selected. We need to tell it what entity or geometry type we want to use. And then we have the actual geometry type, but all types always works pretty well. All right, so then we have a couple different ways of deleting geometry. All right, we can delete by number. And here we have the pattern and the, the range and the selection type. We can delete by bounding volume. We can delete by normal. And we can uh, delete by uh, degenerate type faces. So faces with zero area. Um, stuff like that. Okay? 
So if we come back in here over to the, um, the network view over here, what I'm going to do is uh, just do a really basic example. For the pattern, I just want to delete faces one and three over here. Okay, so let's just do a really basic example of that. So I'm going to type in the number one, then space, then three. And you'll notice that now we have a hole in our box. Okay, so what's happened is we've actually deleted those faces from this mesh by using this node. So they never, they no longer exist in this piece of geometry, except if you go back to the original box, then you can have them back again. All right. So the nice thing about using uh, this non-destructive type workflow when deleting geometry is we can also create a duplicate of this delete node and then paste it. You'll notice that the connection is still made. And we can actually tell it to delete non-selected. So what we do is we end up with just those two faces. So we've inverted that uh, delete operation. Okay. And this allows you to then isolate out faces just almost like how grouping works. Okay. So what we can do is we can then take <coughs> a poly extrude node over here and we can do an inset. All right. Maybe a little bit of a, an extrude like that. Bam. Now we have two pieces of geometry that are completely separate and we can pass them down into another part of the graph and we can do something with just this half and then maybe merge them back together at some point. All right, so it allows you to work um, very in a very flexible way, basically a very non-destructive um, type workflow when you're modeling. So let's take a look at some of the other options we have here. So I'm going to drop down another delete node and feed that box into that. New delete node over there. All right, and we actually have a couple uh, different options here. We can delete by pattern, but that's what we did over here. We gave it a pattern or a set of numbers. Okay. Uh, we can delete by range. So if we delete by range, what it's going to do is it's going to select one of two of every two faces. And basically what we ended up here with is zero, one, two, because all the other values, if we were to duplicate this guy off, were deleted in that range. So that's um, deleting by range there. So here we have the opposite of that. All right, so you can do modeling operations with that stuff. All right, so then if we take a look at some of the other stuff that we have, I'm going to drop down another delete node. Oops. Like so. All right, we can delete by expression, and that allows you to type in a number, basically, or some sort of type of value using uh, some sort of expression. But we actually have a course dedicated to uh, expressions inside of Houdini. So we're just going to skip this portion for now. And we're going to move over to working with normal. All right. And so what we can do is just like in the group node, we can actually delete based off of normal. So if I bring that spread angle down, you'll notice that I delete just the face where it's normal is actually pointing upwards and Y because I've set it to one and Y. All right, and if I increase that spread angle, then I'll delete those side faces. This is actually better seen with a sphere, so let's do that. Let's drop down a sphere. And we'll do that, like so. And we'll make sure that we have a polygon mesh created for this. We'll go to delete, and we'll change that spread angle. So it allows us to delete based off of the normal angle, basically. All right. And then degenerate really is just for cleaning up. Um, and then we also have the bounding volume. <clears throat> so if you have the uh, bounding volume actually enabled, I'm going to turn off the normal type delete. Um, what we can do is we can create like a bounding sphere and we can move its center around. You'll notice that we're actually starting to get this little sphere out there. Um, that will determine where things get deleted. So it's got a radius to it. <clears throat> so when you start working with things like terrain and you want to remove, you know, sections based off of volume, um, this is a great way to do that. All right. So the last node that we're going to cover, and it's a really simple node, um, is the 
blast node. So the blast node is basically just a simplified version of that delete node. And you'll notice that we don't really have any sort of um, parameters to tweak. All right, but it just takes in a value and it's expecting a group. So what we need to do is create a new group node, call this um, box faces. All right, and because we haven't set any sort of uh, parameters, the whole mesh is going to be selected. And so what we can do is we can set it to box faces, but obviously we don't see our mesh because we're not isolating out any faces. So let's just put zero space one. And now what I've done is I've removed faces zero and one from this particular box over here because those guys are selected. All right, and that is how the blast node works. All right, much simpler. It's also a faster node when you start to deal with um, optimizing your networks for speed and performance. So using a blast node um, takes less computation time than a delete node does. All right, so that is the delete node and the blast node. Thanks so much. Welcome to Intro to Procedural Modeling, Lesson 7. In this particular lesson, we are going to start to look, take a look at how we can loft, or what Houdini calls sweep or skin, um, other uh, objects around a curve to create spline-based models. All right. And we're also going to take a look at how we can actually use a curve, um, both with the shelf and inside of the network view. So let's start with that. All right, so let's start by doing the, the most simplest way of creating a curve. I'm going to click on this uh, shelf tool up here where it says curve. It's in the create section, and I'm just going to start to click some points. All right, and if you need, need to navigate around, remember, hold down the space bar, and then let go to continue creating a curve. And then when you're finished, just hit enter, and the curve will be completed. All right. And Remember to hit escape to enter or exit out of the creation mode. And there we go. So now you'll notice that we have a new geometry um, node here, a, a parent tra transform basically. All right, and below that we actually have a curve node. All right, and you can actually create this on your own as well. If you just hit tab and start typing in curve, we can create our own curve. But when we go and turn on that particular curve, that blue display flag for this node, we don't actually have any curve. Well. If we click back to the curve we've just created on the node itself, there's a whole bunch of points inside of that particular curve. So if we take a look at our curve node that we created in the network view, there are no points. And so what, what's happening is it's waiting for me to hit enter on the keyboard to enter into that creation mode. So I'm going to hit enter and you notice that I'm now in creation mode and you get a message down here at the bottom that says, um, <clears throat> left click to add points, hold shift to move off the construction plane basically, and then press enter to complete. So now I can actually click and you'll notice that this field up here for the node is being populated. So I'm just going to hit enter because I'm happy with the placement there. And then escape to get to my camera view or my camera tool over here. All right. So if you want to actually start to manipulate the points on the curve, both from the shelf created curve and the curve node that we created, um, all we have to do is um, hit the S key and we can start to select either the curve geometry or we can switch over to points and we can start to select the points as well. Then we just hit T, we can start to move the, the points around. So that allows us to select all those guys. But you'll notice that when we do it in that fashion, we actually get this extra edit node. And that's not really what we want. Okay, so what we can do is we can actually, to get rid of that edit node or the automatic creation of that edit node, we can actually just select the node, come back into the scene view here and hit enter again to go back into that creation mode where we can add more points or we can basically move the points around like that. And so if we want to add a new point, we can hold down the shift key and start to add another point. So it puts it back into that creation mode and then hit enter and we can actually then just click each point before we hit escape to move the points to where we want them to be. 
you need to notice that all the values up here are being updated. All right, so I'm going to hit escape to get out of that creation mode. And let's actually take a, a look at some of these parameters in the curve node itself. All right, so we have uh, the type, so we have polygon, NURBS, and Bezier. All right, so this NURBS curve is really handy when you want, want to start to try to make really smooth lofted models. Um, we can close the curve. All right, in this case, it's not really going to do much for us. We can reverse the order of the curve. So this basically makes it go from zero to one and then oops, zero to one this way. All right. Then you can change the order of the curve. All right. And finally, we have fitting properties. But this only works when you start to uh, work with the thing is the Bezier's. Yeah. So if we put on the breakpoints, basically we can start to fit the curve a little bit more precisely to the Bezier curve. All right, and so let's actually just do the simplest uh, method of lofting here, okay? And that is using the uh, sweep node over here. So in order to uh, use a sweep node, we also need to have another primitive that defines basically the uh, cross section of the, the model that we're going to loft. Currently, this curve is going to act as like the backbone to our lofted um, cross section. Okay, so what I'm going to do is drop down a sweep node, and then I'm going to drop down a line node. All right. So you notice that the the sweep node actually has three inputs. All right. So if we middle mouse click on each one of these inputs, we can see what these inputs are expecting. So we have the cross section, we have the backbone. And then we have reference points. All right, so let's just cover the first two first, just to get a better feel for how all this works. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what our line is like. Currently, it is by default pointing straight up in Y. Okay. So let's actually just use that um, that curve itself. So what we want to do is we want to feed our backbone curve. So let's just actually name this the backbone. I'll feed that in the backbone, and this is going to be our cross section. All right, and I'm going to feed that into the cross section. And now you notice that we get a line copied basically to every point. But what we can do with the sweep node is we can actually skin it with auto closure. Or you can skin it unclosed. All right, you can skin unclosed with preserve shape. So basically, what we've done is we've created a um, a surface, a lofted surface using the sweep node. And you'll notice from a display uh, perspective here that the back faces are being removed from this particular model. So if you want to turn that off and you want to be able to see both sides, you can hit D on the keyboard and go to the optimization tab for the display options here and just turn off remove back faces. And now we can see both sides. So now what we can do is we can actually move the points on the curve. So if I select my backbone curve here, hit enter, I can actually start to manipulate where these points go, like so. All right, so we can further modify our particular lofted mesh here. All right. And everything here is also non-destructive, so we can change the direction of our line. So I'm going to not have a point in any direction and then point it in the X direction. And now we get more of like a road type situation. All right, let's put it on the Z direction and see what we get. And now this one is actually pointing. So if we actually turn off the auto closure, you'll notice that we get the line put basically on almost like something like the tangent of the curve itself. All right. So let's actually just keep it on the X direction for now and turn off the Z direction there. All right, and let's turn back on our auto closure there. And now what we can do is we can actually increase the size of the actual line that we have to create a wider road, if you will. We can also change this uh, backbone to a NURBS curve. And you notice that we get a little bit more of a smooth curve, but the sweep node is actually still calculating the copies of that line 
based off of the breakpoints or the CVs of this particular NURBS curve here. So what needs to happen is we actually need a way to resample this particular curve. And we can do that by using that Bezier method, but there's actually a separate node called resample. All right, so if we take a look at resample, resample I actually take your curve and put an appropriate point, so many max uh, segment lengths, if you want. Um, and that will actually provide way more points for the sweep to work on, and that'll give you a way more smooth curve over here. And yet we can still modify just those singular points on our particular curve. So there's a point around here somewhere. Ah, it's over here. <clears throat> so I need to select the curve here. There we go. Just wanted to clean that up a little bit. There we go. So everything still updates basically. We can move the point on the curve around. Now you notice that um, we don't keep the actual length. If we look at our resample here and we, we increase or decrease this value here, you notice that the length, the original length of the curve is actually being modified. So if you're using the maximum segment length, we can also just turn on the maintain last vertex and it will always try to keep that last vertex. But you'll notice every once in a while you get a situation where these points are really close together. Well, instead of using the max segment length, let's just use max segments and pump that all the way up. And what we get is a nice clean curve that can go way above. And we have perfectly even segment lengths around the whole curve that we just created. So there you go. That is how you create roads or sidewalks or any sort of lofted surface. Okay, so that's how the uh, the uh, sweep node works there. Let's take a look at how the uh, skin works. Okay, so in, let's drop down a skin node first. There we go. And you'll notice that the skin node actually has two inputs. We have the U and we have the V cross sections. All right. But you'll notice that input one says U and possibly V cross sections. So what we need here to actually demonstrate this are two lines. Let me just create a line here. And I'm going to turn that guy on over there. I'm going to zoom in by hitting spacebar G. All right. So what I want to do is I want to take this line and I'm going to transform it over one in Z. All right. And what I want to do is merge those two lines together now. So I'm going to take the original line and the transform line, merge them back together. So I have two lines now. Okay. And I'm going to feed that into the skin. And what you get is a plane. All right. But this plane is now relatively procedural, not a very impressive example, but you'll notice that by using a skin, we can basically loft between two curves to get geometry. All right. All right. And those are the uh, two main methods for um, actually creating lofted surfaces uh, inside of Houdini. Thanks so much.